thank you for inviting me to your assembly. Um, the sportsmen among us um, and those who follow sports, I hope we realise the influence we can have on the world around us at the moment and what happens in the future. Um, during the, the, the big summer holiday, I don't know why I did this, but I decided to read up a little bit on some of the history of, of cricket. Um, I got, that um, yeah, sounds a bit boring, I know, but I, I got fed up when I got to modern times. I was quite interested in some of the things that happened in the past, um, things that I didn't know. Um, as recent as 1910, cricket was one of the most popular sports in America. And they wanted to play some international cricket against other countries, and England being one of those countries refused to play against them, Australia, India as well. And because of that, they lost interest and they went on and played something else. And that made me think, I've had a career for 40 years in, uh, in and around professional sport, and I thought, would my life have been different if England had made a choice to play against America all those years ago? Another interesting fact that I didn't realise as well, that cricket was very popular in Germany, up to the Second World War, and that chap Hitler came along and decided he didn't like the game, the game wasn't played anymore, and all the shops that were selling equipment, they were all destroyed, so that uh, the sport was lost to that country. So there's lots of stories to, through our, our history. And as it is Black History Month, um, and apartheid being a, a very influential um, happening, in the world of sport and the the way that South Africa has, has evolved in uh, over the last 50, 60, 70 years. Um, and me being born in 1961, right slap bang in the middle of it, I'm playing sport around that time, I thought it might be a topic that, that I was able to come and, and speak about. Um, first of all, what is apartheid? Apartheid was, all the words are on there of course, apartheid was a system of Races, racial segregation that existed in South Africa from 1948 until the 1990s, when South Africa was dominated politically and socially and economically by the nation's white minority. They prohibited the mixing of races on transport, beaches, restaurants, in marriages. White people had all the privileges. And if you went to a sports venue in the 50s, for example, you might see entrance to the stadium, something like that where we've got separate entrances for different races and different privileges when you went inside the ground. Um, the population was classified in 1950 into four racial groups, black, white, coloured and Indian. During this period, South African cricket was, was pretty strong. It was played exclusively by, by white cricketers in, in South Africa and it was strong, they had a good team. Um, and despite apartheid, South Africa took part in international cricket and despite their laws, England and other cricket playing nations continued to play against South Africa. Until then, this chap came along, Basil de Oliveira, anybody heard of him? I played cricket against his son, his grandson plays for Worcester at the moment. Um, Basil de Oliveira, um, a Cape coloured, a non-white South Africa, he came to England in 1960 to play for Middleton Cricket Club, which is just down the road on the outskirts of Manchester. Those of you who know the structure of, of league cricket in our area, each team traditionally has one paid professional who boosts the standard and creates lots of interest in the area. Uh, Middleton Cricket was in the uh, cricket club was in the Central Lancashire League, and they contacted Basil Oliveira, a good cricketer from South Africa, to uh, to come over and play for them. He did well, Worcestershire signed him on, so he played some county cricket, and in 1964 he became a British citizen. 1968 was a tour to South Africa. England were looking at selecting the team, Dolivier was in the frame because he was a good player and he did well. South Africa got wind, wind about this, they were unhappy, they put pressure on the MCC, which is England's governing body. They put pressure on the MCC to not select him for the tour party and he wasn't selected. But then a player dropped out injured, Tom Cartwright from Derbyshire. He dropped out, Dolivira was called up. South African Prime Minister B.J. Vorster said this was unacceptable, he wasn't happy about it. England were about to select a non-white player and England wouldn't deselect him and the tour was cancelled. Following this, South Africa were excluded from international cricket for 22 years. 
So, quite a long time in the wilderness there. During the excluded years, a few things happened. South African cricket continued to go on domestically. Um, they had some amazing players within the, the setup there. Some who we'd never seen on the international stage. Um, there's one guy who I, we talk about, um, Barry, Barry Richards was in the Graham Pollock, if, uh, if you, you follow the, the cricket. Mike Proctor was a fantastic all-rounder, probably a better cricketer than both them, um, or Flintoff in, in his heyday, who never got the chance to play international cricket. There were some rebel tours which took place. Certain countries brought teams which were supposedly representative of the nation, with players leaving aside morals for lucrative paychecks to come and play in these games in South Africa. In this country there were protests of this nature, people walking around the streets with placards, uh, trying to get their the feelings across that they didn't, didn't believe it was right for these, these rebels to go to South Africa and play in these tours. In South Africa, um, the demonstrations were a, a little bit more um, energetic um, and a bit more influential. Um, you might call them riots. And Mike Gatton, who was captain of the England Rebels at the time, one particular game, there were tens of thousands of people who were protesting outside the ground. They were not happy about cricket taking place under this banner. He went out there to try and reason with these people and, um, and he was lucky to come out of that situation unscathed. Um, you watch the footage of it, it, it really was a scary moment for him with, the, with people trying to put their, their opinions across quite forcibly. Um, after that, the, um, the rebel tours were cancelled and, and for a period South Africa were on their, were on their own. Then, Nelson Mandela um, came on the scene. Um, how did apartheid end? Um, Nelson Mandela, um, our South African anti-apartheid revolutionary, um, he trained to be a lawyer in Johannesburg. He joined the African National Congress, which is um, often referred to as the ANC in 1943, and they were committed to overthrow apartheid. 1962, he was arrested, not for the first time, but he was arrested for his political views and was made to serve 27 years in prison, which was mainly on Robben Island, which is an island off Cape Town. In 1990, amid fears of racial civil war, President F.W. de Klerk released Mandela. Mandela then negotiated with F.W. de Klerk the end of apartheid, and in 1994, he was voted president in the first ever multiracial general election. And then South Africa were back in international cricket and t teams such as England, we started touring and I was fortunate enough to be selected in the first England touring team to go to South Africa in over 30 years, that was in 1995. Um, before um, I started having the stress of, of school life and uh, the odd grey haircut team, I'm, I'm in the middle row there. Um, with one or two um, cricketers who you might recognise, and an old boy Michael Adderton, captain of the team. So that tour, um, it was um, you know, a landmark tour because it was the first time we've been there for 30 years. Um, our first game was at Soweto. Mandela was around quite a bit. He was a real influential character in, that, in the country at the time. Um, he came to meet us all um, at Soweto. We all lined up before the game. Um, I've managed to get a, a picture there. The two hands meeting is something that was special to me. Um, we also had David Malcolm in our team who was born in the West Indies, born in Barbados, um, and he came to England at a very early age. So he was a, a black cricketer who played for England. Um, Mandela was really interested to find out about his backstory and how he got, got playing for England. Um, also, Mandela's um, bodyguard, if you will, a security officer, um, Rory Stair, who, if you Google him, he's, he's got lots of stuff on, on YouTube, he now goes to talking at seminars, um, he's written books about, uh, about South Africa, its history, its politics, and looking after Mandela. Um, he also looked after us as well, so we would have breakfast with, uh, with Mandela in the morning, do, do all this stuff, then he would come and do our security, so our links with, with Mandela was, was, was 
quite open and accessible through the same security uh, uh, people. So um, that was an amazing experience for us to be so close to somebody who's such an influential character in history. We got some photographs at the top there. We had a trip to Robin Island and we looked at the cell that, that Mandela spent 22 years or, or something of that at that time. Um, not very luxurious and uh, you know, you're not getting away from that island in a hurry. If any of you represent um, senior cricket and rugby teams and you've gone to to South Africa, you will probably be fortunate enough to do the Robin Island trip. We also went to visit um, the township in uh, Alexander Township in Johannesburg. Um, that was a very strange experience for me. Um, I, I had interest, but I felt very uncomfortable. Um, there was uh, not all the squad went. Um, a few of us went, and we went in a vehicle with uh, we had a priest, a nun, um, and we had some security officers as well. And we went round to see how the people lived in the township, which was about two square miles and about 700,000 people within this um, township, which consisted of houses that were made of um, wood, corrugated metal, um, fiberglass sheets, um, bricks, um, not a lot of power. If you did have any electricity, it's because somebody had risked their life and they tapped into one of the pylons that went, went nearby. Um, it, it, was, it wasn't a great way of living and I felt really uncomfortable being in that situation where yes I had an interest and I wanted to see what it was like but I felt so uncomfortable at how I would be perceived by the people who were living in those conditions. You know, I, I, they would see me privileged white man and all I wanted to do was show this has nothing to do with me. Um, it was quite an uncomfortable moment. Um, we did some coaching um, just outside the township with some, some, some young boys who, who lived in conditions like this and their enthusiasm to play the sport that, that many people have been denied to, the right to was, was amazing and uh, um, they had a, a, a lot of energy. Um, I don't have many, um, I say I've been in professional sport about 40 years now and I have very few keepsakes and very, um, and very few bits of memorabilia. Um, what I have got is a uh, personalised copy of, uh, of Mandela's autobiography. With, he must be an amazing judge of sportsman, Mandela. He must have done a lot of reading up on Robin Island. Uh, so he wrote a nice message in there uh, to Mike Robinson, compliments and best wishes to an outstanding sportsman, Nelson Mandela, 2nd of December 1995. This is the book here. Um, I, don't, I don't have very much to. Uh, to look back on through my career, the old medley here and there, and the old, old clip on YouTube, but that is something that's very special to me. And, and after the tour, somebody who was connected to the security organisation there gave me all the bits and pieces to put in this montage frame, whatever it is, with a, a signed photograph of FW de Clerc, um, a message from Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who's a peace campaigner, and um, God bless you. Desmond Tutu, and another message from Mandela, and uh, me proudly wearing the um, Tet de Beer uh, sponsorship logo that we, that we wore then. Uh, those are things that, that I kept in special to me because I thought that that too was something that um, you know, it was a once in a lifetime experience, and I was fortunate to be in that place at the time and um, be part of it. So where are we now? Um, South African cricket, it, it's an amazingly strong and competitive team. Um, we see a photograph there, that's the South African under-19s team who are winning their one-day trophy. Um, they're competitive, um, it welcomes everybody into the team regardless of race. It's still a work in progress. South Africa is now multiracial at all levels. Um, there's still work to do, the playing side is good, um, the infrastructure, the succession planning on administration planning, it's still not quite there and as slick as it would like to be, um, yeah, but they're, they're working through it and if we think it was 1995 when South Africa um, first got back into international cricket and we are still working our way through things. It's, uh, it just shows how, how, uh, how difficult to challenge and 
the fact that with all the resources now from 1995, things are still not perfect. It just shows uh, how much time certain, certain changes need to take. Um, I hope you find that interesting. Um, it is part of my career that I'm very proud of and uh, I've been pleased to share with you today. Thank you.